Thank you all for coming out for our third annual Pitch 90 event hosted by the Delaware Environmental Institute. I hope you're all as excited as I am to hear about some of the exciting and innovative research that's going on by some of our students, graduate and undergraduate, um, here at UD. And also we have several representatives here tonight from our partner institutions. We have students from Delaware Technical Community College, Delaware State University, and Wesley College as well. So um, we're happy to have all of them and we thank all of you participants for being brave souls and signing up um, to participate tonight. Um, before we get started, I'd like to give a big thank you to the staff of the Delaware Environmental Institute. Without you, um, this event certainly would not be possible. Um, and in particular to Beth Chages, the communications director at the Environmental Institute. She really helped um, advertise and organize this event um, and we couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> Um, so I believe in your program it says that we'll have Josh Lamont, who is our Master of Ceremonies tonight, come up. Um, but he's actually had a flight delay, so we're going um, to see how quickly he can get here. But um, I'll just go ahead and introduce the, the judges. Um, and we really appreciate you all taking the time to be here tonight. Um, we have judges that represent um, small businesses, industry, academia, and government positions within the state of Delaware and surrounding areas. So thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna introduce all of you, and if you can hold your applause at the end, we'd like to um, thank them together. So we have Hadi Al-Khatib, who's our um, research associate here at UD. You can, if you can stand up and, and wave to the back. And Hadi was last year's winner, so we're um, extra glad to have him here tonight. Um, we have Ann Artis, who's the Senior Vice Provost for Graduate and Professional Education at UD. Mary Anderson, who's a local potter and has Mary Anderson Pottery. <laughs> we have Tracy Bryant, who's the Director for Research Com Communications here at UD. Kara Coates, who's the Deputy Secretary at the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. John Cox, who's an Assistant Professor of Art and Design at UD. Malcolm D'Souza, a professor and associate dean at Wesley College. Helen Fischel, the director of education and organizational development at the Delaware Nature Society. Barbara Garland, who's the founder of Image Visions. Um, Ryan German, who owns Cafe Gelato. Susan Love, is she here? Okay. Um, we have Jeanette Miller, who's the associate director of Delaware Environmental Institute. Shannon Murray, who's a student and 4-H um, participant at Padua Academy. Victor Perez, who's an assistant professor of sociology at UD. Abigail Seitz, who's the executive director at the Abundance Academy of Dance. Amy Slocum, who's the associate director of Delaware EPSCOR and also works for the Delaware Environmental Institute. Rick Spiesman, who's a partner at KPMG and David Wunsch, the director and state geologist of Delaware Geological Survey. So let's give them all a big round of applause. <laughs> so judges, I know you have the hardest, hardest job tonight of um, judging these phenomenal students and their pitches. So just to give you a quick briefing of how this is gonna work, we judge our participants based on three criteria and those include content, originality and creativity, and stage presence. So you'll score each contestant on a scale of one to 10, one being the lowest and 10 being the highest. Um, and this will move pretty quickly. There won't be much time between the 90 seconds. So um, try to get your scores in and your comments in as, as the folks are talking and we'll give you some time at intermission to kind of fill the scores back in. Um, notes to the participants, when you see your name in the hole on this screen here, you're going to go to my left or your right of these black curtains, come around to the front, and um, someone will be waiting here to fit you with a microphone. Um, and from the second that you get on stage um, and start talking, the timer will start. So there's also, if you look back here at the TV, this will be counting down as well. So if you, you want that visual aid of helping you with the, the countdown, you can look back there or you can choose not to, which is what I always did. Um, <laughs> so um, let's give everyone who's participating tonight a big round of applause before they get started. Give them some encouragement. 
And really quickly, to, to settle everyone's nerves, we're gonna do a little bit of a trivia session, and we do have some prizes for this. So if I can get four volunteers from the audience. Do I have any brave souls? You? <laughs> you? Anyone else? Yeah, come on up. <laughs> Judges, you can volunteer too. We'll do another one after the intermission. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> well, everyone's a winner winner in this trivia, so that's a we have consolation prizes. So um, <laughs> we'll divide you up into two teams. So you two and you two will be together, um, and we're gonna do this as the best two out of three answers. Um, and the winners will get a Denon swag bag that contains a coffee mug and a jump drive, and uh, we'll also let you go to the back and pick out a T-shirt. <laughs> Um, so we'll start um, with a more local trivia quiz, um, and this will be um, for the state of Delaware. Um, so the first question that I'll ask is, what percentage of land area within the state of Delaware is classified as a wetland? Um, and you have a couple of seconds to discuss among yourselves. What percentage is considered wetland? <laughs> All right, is this team ready? We're good? All right, your answer? 38%. Very good. 30%. 30%. So the correct answer is actually 25%. So you guys are going to win this one. It's <laughs> okay. All right, we'll keep the environmental theme, but um, go a little bit to, uh, to a broader area. So how many years are needed to produce about one inch of topsoil, which is the most productive of soil in nature? How many years? One inch, yes. How many years are needed to produce through um, weathering processes one inch of topsoil? Okay, we'll give you five more seconds. <laughs> you guys ready? I'm gonna make them answer first yeah, this yeah, time. Well, yeah, I'm thinking like geological time scale, so I'm gonna say a million years. A million years, all right. <laughs> I'm gonna say a hundred years. <laughs> all right, that was a little bit closer. It's actually 500 years. Uh, all right, so we, we are gonna have to have a... <laughs> So you guys have won. We each won one. It's okay. Tied. All right. We have it. Thank you for keeping up with. I'm not yeah. keeping up with this very well. <laughs> oh, you are keeping. We won both. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. All right. All right. This is this is a good one. If do we have any oceanographers on the stage? Oh, <laughs> we have a couple. All right. That that evens out the, the scoring. Okay. How. How much of our ocean have we explored percentage-wise? <laughs> You're both ready? Explored. Yeah, what's explored? Like mapped or actually been there? I did not come up with this question. Oh, <laughs> oh okay, okay. I'm gonna say less than 1%. Okay. Same answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna go back to the drawing board. Um, I, have, I have here that the answer is less than 5%, so you guys, we're both, both close. All right. All right, let's see if we can get away from a tiebreaker on this one. What is the most common type of trash thrown away by Americans? A, I'm gonna give you some choices. <laughs> A, paper products and cardboard. B, metal. C, glass, or D, plastics? You said thrown away. Thrown away, right? right? Like just thrown away. Yes. All right. Do we have answers? Okay. Oh, okay. Plastic. Oh, 
Yes. Plastic. Same oh answer. All right. The answer is actually paper products and cardboard. Oh. We're not smart. We're not smart. Okay, we're going to do another we number question. Listen to the biologist. Okay. All right, this one's definitely going to be the tiebreaker. What is the average annual temperature in Delaware in Fahrenheit? All seasons. Annual. Annual temperature. Okay, so from January to December. Yeah. Yes, January to December, average temperature. What year did you get your data? <laughs> I did not. <laughs> this was handed to me. All right, while they're deliberating, if we can get um, Tyler Sowers, our first contestant, to go ahead and get suited up with a microphone. Is he already over there? Oh, okay, great. Is, is Shang here? He's here? All right, Shang, can, is he over here already? All right, great. Your answers, please. 59 degrees. We're going to say 65 degrees. Oh, that was very close. It's actually 56.8 degrees. So you guys each get a flag oh my bag. God. Oh, that one's empty. Can you I have a bag now. I know. Okay, grab this. Is there something in each of those? Yeah. And then you can go back and um, Alicia will get you a t-shirt in your size. And then you guys will get a consolation prize of either a coffee thermos or a jump drive. Okay. Jump drive. Yeah. I have juices for that. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you guys for participating. And with that, we'll go ahead and get things started. So first up, we have Tyler Sowers, who's a student in the College of Ag and Natural Resources here at UD. Tyler. Good to start. Hello, everyone. When we think about exploration in its most basic form, we typically think of looking to the stars or maybe looking out to the distant horizon. However, I look in a different direction, the soil. Throughout my life, I've often thought about this literal foundation of mankind, has to provide food, nutrients, hold resources. But now, my, re my next soil exploration revolves around looking into how the soil holds the building block of life, which is carbon. Carbon is a vital resource for plants and microbes, but also acts as a guard against climate change. Climate, carbon released to the atmosphere can promote climate change, and soils hold more organic carbon than any other source on Earth. Therefore, soils play a major role in ensuring our everyday life remains unaltered. With this in mind, my current research revolves around looking into how soil carbon cycles in soils of different land use, and also under different environmental conditions, such as temperature and water conditions. We hope this research will not only allow us to better understand soil carbon cycling, but will also have implications to help us better manage for climate change and for soil productivity. Clearly, soil is vital to our everyday existence and is in need of further scientific discovery. Therefore, with this in mind, I'd ask the next time you look to the stars on a moonlit night or to the horizon of a breaking dawn, look also to the undiscovered wonders of the soil. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Can we get to Shang's? All right, next up we have Shang Wu from the College of Ag and Natural Resources as well. All right. Have you ever wanted to go fishing but found out the pond is filled with filthy green water? In fact, over 70% of the waterways in the United States are considered as impaired which means they are not good enough for their designated use, such as drinking, fishing, or swimming. In Delaware, this situation is even worse. 94% of the waterways are not good enough for fish to thrive. So what is causing this problem? Big plants draining dirty water into the river? 
No. In fact, most of the pollution comes from non-point sources, which means we cannot identify who is actually polluting. For example, agricultural production is the largest non-point source of pollution. Excess fertilizers get washed into the river and becomes excess nutrients. So my research aims to deal with this problem in two phases. First, I conduct an economic experiment to understand how people behave and respond under different policy and, treat and information treatments. And second, I use the findings to feed into an agent-based computer simulation environment to see how these results will scale up in a spatially explicit watershed. So if my research is successful, maybe someday we'll see, we'll see the water to become beautiful again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shang. Next up, we have Lily Neff from Wesley College. What is everyone's goal in life? To be safe and financially stable, right? Well, higher academic institutions have the same goal. Why is that? Well, in which major is there the most likelihood to have accidents? Chemistry, right? Think about it. You're working with potentially highly toxic and hazardous chemicals that can cause bodily damage in numerous ways, whether internally or externally. And colleges obviously don't want to be sued. So this is where Quartzy comes into play. Quartzy is a free online laboratory management platform. Think of it as a big chemical library. And it helps institutions achieve these goals. Prior to the limitation of Quartzy, there was no way to track and identify misplaced chemicals and chemical incompatibilities. And this greatly increased the chance of an accident occurring. My research has been to implement this system at Wesley College. And from this, we have further reduced the risk of injuries to individuals. This has allowed our undergraduate laboratories to take on a proactive, not reactive, role in regards to the safety of our faculty, students, and future personnel. Along with this, implementing the online Quartzy platform has allowed us to develop a sustainable system for streamlining the management and documentation of our chemicals. This has allowed us to develop strategies that increase our recycling capacity, reduce our chemical waste production, and decrease our budget used. So far, Quartz has helped us save over $12,000. This is about 25% of our annual expenditures. And this extra money saved has allowed us to sponsor two additional summer internships. And the best part, Quartz is free. Thank you. Great, right, thank you, Lily. Next up, we have Julia Guimond from the UD College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment. The carbon cycle, a series of events by which all the processes, all the carbon in our global ecosystem moves between the atmosphere, living in dead organisms, the ocean, and eventually back into the atmosphere. Ideally, the sequence ensures that our global carbon household is balanced, that the right amount of carbon is stored in each reservoir. But this global balance is under attack. Not only are we burning fossil fuels at an unprecedented rate, we are also cutting down vast swaths of forests, destroying important carbon storage areas. It's like trying to pour more and more water into a smaller and smaller glass. Unfortunately, another important carbon storage area is threatened. I'm talking about salt marshes. Yes, the egg-smelling grassy areas you drive by on the way to the beach hold more carbon per cubic meter than a tropical rainforest. But they are disappearing fast. By the end of the century, over half of salt marshes could be gone due to sea level rise. And this is where my research comes in. Through physical and chemical tests in the field and the use of high-powered computer models, I study how water movement through a marsh, think tides, rain, storms, impacts the chemical reactions taking place within it and how that in turn impacts the behavior of carbon. By connecting marsh physics to marsh chemistry, my goal is to develop a model that will help predict the fate of the salt marsh carbon reservoir. This could be a potent tool in our effort to conserve the remaining marsh areas if it's not already too late. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Julia. Next up, we have Jill Harlan from UD College of Arts and Sciences. What do you think when I say the word innovation? Maybe light bulbs, heating, computers, or even Fitbits come to mind. What do you think when I say innovations of the future? Hoverboards, teleportation? 
Well, actually, the answer is ionic liquids. According to a poll in the UK, ionic liquids are voted the number one innovation to shape the 21st century. Ionic liquids are salts, just like the table salt you sprinkle on your popcorn. But instead of being solid, they're liquid, and this gives them an insurmountable number of applications. Have you ever walked down the street and seen that black gook that was once chewing gum, now forever ingrained in the sidewalk? <laughs> Ionic liquids can easily remove that. Have you ever heard the high-pitched beeping of the fire alarm telling you it's time to change the batteries and wishing that batteries lasted longer? Ionic liquids are being studied to increase battery life. Have you read or heard in the news about the importance of capturing greenhouse gases in order to save our planet? Well, that's where my research comes in. I study ionic liquids for carbon dioxide capture. Right now, what's currently being used is toxic and corrosive. Ionic liquids could be the superhero of gas capture. They can capture more carbon dioxide and be less harmful than what's currently being used. Can you taste the future? If my research successfully reveals an ionic liquid that can efficiently capture carbon dioxide, then they could fulfill their potentials as innovations of the future, and they could improve our world. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jill. Next up, we have Talzi Sun from the UD College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Thank you. So when you eat fresh vegetables and fruits, do you wash them? What washing method do you use? Do you believe the produce is clean and safe after washing? Actually, our experimental results indicate if you don't use the suitable washing method, the answer is no. Someone may think, so what? We have antibodies. Well, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, each year, 48 million Americans become sick, and over 3,000 die as a result of foodborne illnesses. And fresh produce causes more illnesses than any other single kind of food. Then you might be thinking, what are suitable washing methods? That is my research. Bacterial contamination is a major source of foodborne disease. My research has been studying the mechanisms involved in bacterial attachment and removal on the fresh produce. And we have gained significant insights. So based on those understandings, we are trying to develop non-toxic, simple, and effective washing methods to remove pathogens from fresh produce surfaces. And meanwhile, ensuring that fresh produce maintain their high levels of vitamins and minerals. If we succeed, we will bring you a healthier life. Thank you. Thank you, Talzu. How are we doing, judges? It's pretty fast-paced. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have Julie Steinberg from the UD College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment. Have you ever seen those images of sea turtles with six-pack beverage holders around their neck? or dolphins stuck in fishing gear? That litter that ends up in our waters is marine debris, a result of people not properly disposing of their trash. It was these images that first inspired me to become more conscious of my waste habits. Maybe you're like me. You don't litter. You bring a reusable bag to the grocery store. You consider yourself to be an environmentally conscious person. But even so, it's not enough. We're still contributing to marine debris, and I'll tell you why. When we go home, our clothes go into the washing machine, or in just one wash, 700,000 microscopic microfibers, a form of marine debris, will be released into the wastewater. Think how many times you wash your clothes in a year. What about the rest of the university? As you imagine the scope of the problem, the scale gets that much larger. As a grad student who's studying marine debris, the fact that I am still unintentionally contributing to this problem just shows how much further we have to go to develop solutions for an issue this pervasive. Policies are needed because there's no personal action which will be enough to resolve this issue. But because marine debris is such a complex problem, there's a lack of consensus on how this can be achieved. By examining marine debris hotspots in the United States, my research examines relevant laws and then determines the best path for future policy management. There's a lack of organization in response to the problem of marine debris, and only by addressing this will we be able to move towards solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Next up, we have Caitlin Ritchie, also from the UD College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment. Do 
you worry about your drinking water? Have you ever had your water tested for harmful contaminants? I drink my tap water all the time. I haven't had it tested, but I still trust it. But this isn't the case everywhere. So if we feel comfortable with our water, should we still be concerned about drinking water quality for others? Yes. Over 18 million Americans live in communities that are in violation of the law. These laws, like the lead and copper rule, are designed to protect us, to ensure that our drinking water is safe. We've all heard about Flint, Michigan. Lead levels exceeded 10,000 parts per billion, even though the contamination standard is 15 parts per billion, and the goal is zero. My research is focused on Southbridge, Wilmington. Southbridge research has shown that over half of the residents there believe that their drinking water is polluted. So, if Southbridge is located near all these brown fields, uh, these are former industrial sites that could be contaminated with heavy metals like arsenic. And I'm trying to understand the perceptions of drinking water in Southbridge. So, um, yeah. So, my research is testing resident water for different water quality measures. We're using home test kits and professional laboratories to determine if we can make a difference in the neighborhood and provide ease of mind for the residents in Southbridge. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Ooh. Next up, we have Elizabeth Fiedler from Delaware State University. Hi, um, so my research deals with sweet potatoes and you know, you know, everyone's like, oh God, sweet potatoes are coming up, it's Thanksgiving. They're kind of the forgotten side dish. They could be a pie, they can be, they could be smushed like crushed uh, mashed potatoes. Um, so basically the issue with that, I'm looking at disease tolerance between three different sweet potato genotypes and looking at how gene expression changes over time because from generation to generation, they become like inundated with more and more viruses. One virus on its own won't necessarily hurt the plant on a whole as far as yield goes. However, two or more viruses cause a disease complex that can be detrimental to a farmer's yield, sometimes 80 to 100% yield loss. So, you're just like, okay, well, there's sweet potatoes. Like, we can just eat regular potatoes. Well, actually, the real thing with sweet potatoes is in a lot of developing countries, they're very important because they're a subsistence crop. Like, the people that produce it are the ones who also probably eat it. And it's also often called a famine crop because it gets them through to the next to, until they can stabilize their food situation a little more, like families. And it provides People that don't have access to medicine or healthcare, it has beta carotenes, it's packed with them. You know how carrots are good for you? Well, they're packed with beta carotenes, which is important for growing children as well. Thank you, Thank Elizabeth. You. All right, next up we have Calliope, Calliope Fusas <laughs> from UD College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment. How many of you have heard about Pokemon Go? You know that smartphone game that lets you track down invisible monsters uh, to catch in your area? Well, that's kind of what I do, but instead of invisible monsters, I look for my environmental microbes in coastal sediments. Sp specifically, I look at Bejetoa. Bejetoa are these microbes with string-like bodies that like to glide in sulfur-rich sediments. The reason for this preference for sulfur is because they actually use hydrogen sulfide as their source of energy, unlike you and I, who use carbon. The reason this is important is because hydrogen sulfide is typically poisonous. But Vegetoa, along with other sulfur oxidizing microbes as they're known, can actually remove up to 95% of hydrogen sulfide from sediments, allowing them other organisms to actually survive. Typical habitats where you find Vegetoa include salt marshes and even sewage treatment plants, so think stinky areas. What's interesting is these cells can come together and form these large extensive mats on the surface of sediments. But single cells are so small, they're practically invisible. So it makes it hard to track them down. Now, if only there was some sort of device that I could actually do that for me, right? Well, just like Pokemon Go has that little tracking function that actually lets you know where a Pokemon might pop up, I can actually use DNA extracted directly from sediments to figure out where Bejetoa might pop up. So essentially, I'm using Bejetoa DNA taken from sediments to catch them all, figure out why they form mats, and how they actually eat up the hydrogen sulfide in their environment. Thank you. 
Thank you, Calliope. Next up, we have Mohammed Afsar from the College of Ag and Natural Resources here at UD. Climate change is impacting Delaware. Um, it increases sea level. It, uh, it adversely impacts the uh, overall uh, transport and uh, uh, rise and processes in the soil. And at the same time, 79% of the Delaware is convinced about the impact of uh, sea level, about the impact of sea level rise and extreme precipitation events. So why we are concerned about extreme precipitation events? Because it is significantly influence the biogeochemistry of the soil and particularly the, so the uh, availability and stability of carbon in soil. So the stability of carbon in soil is very important. And the big question is how such extreme precipitation events will modify the stability of carbon in soil. And not knowing this answer will create a big question because we do know that soil is the largest terrestrial carbon pool comprising at least four times more than the plant reservoir and as well as 3.3 times more than the atmospheric carbon. So that's why it is very important to know the stability of carbon under redox, under uh, uh, different climatic condition and as well as under uh, changing climatic condition. At the same time, 90% of this carbon is associated with soil minerals. And uh, these, these minerals are mostly vulnerable to climate change. So our group is trying to uh, uh, understand the feedback between climate change and this mineral organic association. For, uh, particularly under wetland condition. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. All right, next up we have Lane Johnston from UD College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment. We've all heard the age-old adage that sharks are just swimming noses, that they can smell out a single drop of blood in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. But what if I told you that they also rely on a different sense to find and track their prey, that they have a special sixth sense called electroreception? Think of a metal detector. As you're walking along the beach, you swipe it back and forth to find buried treasure. This is kind of like electroreception in sharks. They have unique sensory organs that are located on their head that they use to find things that are buried in the sand. But unlike a metal detector, which is used to find things that are metallic, they use this sense to find things that are alive. Movements that animals make, including humans, release electrical signals into the environment. Every muscle contraction that a fish makes is actually a weak electrical pulse that the sharks can pick up with this special sense. Now don't be scared next time you're swimming, a shark won't be interested in you because you have a really strong electrical si signal. My research looks at how electroreception is used by sharks to find their next meal. Not only that, but I'm looking to see how this sense might be impacted in the future. We all know that our climate is changing. Two of the major consequences of climate change in the oceans are increasing temperatures and ocean acidification, which is just that carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater and makes it more acidic. Understanding how climate change will affect this electrosensory sense in sharks will give us insight into how their foraging techniques may be altered in the future. Thank you, Lane. <laughs> All right, next up we have Hui Dong Zhu from the UD College of Ag and Natural Resources. Hi, imagine I have a scale and on the left side I have two billion people who don't have access to clean water and on the right side I have 80% of the total water consumption is from agriculture. So what can we do to balance this scale to create alternative water source for uh, agriculture irrigation? So we will collect the wastewater from industrial cooling process, from your sinks, and from your washing machines, and then treat them properly. And after that, you will have some clean recycled water. And this recycled water are safe. And uh, actually, uh, farmers all over the world are using recycled water for agricultural irrigation. For example, in Italy, um, recycled water is used to grow olives. And in Israel, recycled water is used to grow dates. And here in California, recycled water is used to grow strawberries, grapes, broccoli, and lots of other produce. But these produce are sold at the same price as those non-recycled water produce. Is that reasonable? Well, here comes my research. So we'll, cons uh, we'll cons cons uh, consumers in the United States pay the same price for this recycled water produce as those non-recycled water produce. And should we lower the price and uh, 
should we lower the price in the, to stimulate the use of recycled water? And hopefully my results will help better manage the use of recycled water. Thank you. Thank you, Huidong. Next up, we have Michael Skyvers from Wesley College. So let's begin by imagining a picture. You're in your nice green lawn and you're applying some fertilizer, but you had a little bit too much, but you don't think differently about it. Then, later on in the week, a rain event occurs and washes that excess fertilizer downstream into the nearest water body. That stream that you swam in when you were little is now on its journey to becoming toxic. That is a problem, or that is non source pollution. That is a problem within the state of Delaware. Luckily though, the Department of Natural Resources, Environmental Control, or DENREC in layman's terms, are trying to find ways to reduce this issue of non-point source pollution. This is where I come into play. This summer I created a map for Delaware on the homeowner's property scale, which shows high-risk areas for water impairment. This, these areas are deemed high risk based on certain factors such as high water table or slope. And with it being on the homeowner scale, you can pinpoint homeowners directly and see who in fact is within this area. This can then be used to do direct mailings, which Denrec hopes to achieve within the near future. And with this, they can help better understand what the issue of high risk lawns is and ways that they can also do to, ways to better manage their fertilizer use. So in the next couple of months or so, keep your eyes peeled. You may or may not get a thing from Denrick. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Next up, we have Jenna Schambach from the UD College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment. So you guys are all going to go home tonight. And the first thing you do when you walk in the door is probably going to be turn on the light. Now, think about where this electricity is coming from. In Delaware, like most of the world, the energy we get for our homes and our cars comes from the combustion of fossil fuels. Now, what if I told you we could temporarily continue to burn these fossil fuels and yet reduce some of these harmful carbon dioxide emissions that contribute to global climate change? Well, my lab looks to do just that. We call this carbon capture and reuse, and we do this using microalgae, or as you may know it, funky green stuff that grows in your pool. <laughs> so let's break this down. Carbon capture involves taking the carbon dioxide emissions coming from these power plants, feeding it into a system where the algae eat the carbon dioxide and grow. The reuse part involves um, harvesting this algae and making it into a product. Now, people are doing this today. You can go onto Google or Amazon and type in algae product, and you'll find an algae-based culinary oil or an algae surfboard. So it's very, very cool, very interesting. But for the majority of this industry, we still face this problem of this process being too expensive. And so what I do is tinker around with some of these conditions that the algae grow in so that we can um, maximize the uh, amount of carbon dioxide that they eat while also using the least amount of resources so that we can reduce this overall cost. So that at the end of the day, we can all come home, turn on our lights, and know that we're not further contributing to global climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Um, next up, we have Abu Olawal from the UD College of the Arts and Sciences. Do you know why there are so many research for breast cancer? Well, maybe it's because there were over 40,000 breast cancer deaths last year. Now, people want to reduce that number. I want to contribute in reducing that number. So in my research, I focused on the risk factor for breast cancer. The risk factor I looked at is mammographic density. Mammographic density is basically the amount of fat and connective tissue in the breast. So let's say you have more um, fat than connective tissue. It means you have low mammographic density. And if you have more connective tissue than fat, it means you have high mammographic density. Now, high mammographic density increases the risk of developing breast cancer. It makes it hard to detect cancer in the breast. So someone with high mammographic density is like someone with a cloudy breast. You can't really see what's going on. Or a better example is a cup in front of, a cloudy cup in front of you. You don't know whether the cup is empty or whether spiders are gonna start crawling out. So the goal in this research is to find a way to identify high mammographic density in women so that they can get treatment as soon as possible. Because one of the key ways of treating breast cancer is early detection. 
Thank you. Thank you, Abu. Uh, next up, we have Edward Brandenburg from Wesley College. Do you guys remember the film, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? The film was pretty cute, right? But if you think about it, it's much scarier than you may think. Why? Because there's some pretty frightening things in that backyard of yours. An example of this would be the millipede. The millipede is a naturally evolved critter that secretes benzoyl cyanide when it's suddenly attacked. And benzoyl cyanide can react with the water molecules in the air to form hydrogen cyanide. Well, hydrogen cyanide is a very dangerous and deadly chemical, and at the right concentrations, is even capable of killing a human being. So good thing we're not in the movie, right? My research pertained to the reaction of this chemical with a variety of other chemicals. Let's not get into too many details, but let's start with the basics. So in all chemical reactions, there's an energy barrier that must be overcome in order for it to come to completion. Think of it like mountain climbing, right? The taller the mountain, the longer it's gonna take for you to get over it. The same thing can be said with chemistry. Um, so with the millipede then, with its production of its secretion molecules, it's easy to assume that it has a pretty low barrier, otherwise it'd be pretty useless for the millipede, right? Well, previous studies suggested otherwise. They thought it had a pretty high barrier, which we kind of questioned. And mathematically, we were able to find a new type of mechanism, one that had a lower barrier, which explained the evolutionary nature of this chemical. But good thing we don't really have to worry about this too much. Millipedes, they're pretty small, and even if you get swarmed by a lot of them, you, like, it won't secrete too much. But if that day ever comes where any of you guys are shrunken to the size of a bug, I'd recommend bringing some bug spray. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Um, next up, we have Tobias Ackerman from the College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment. Thank you. Pollution enters waterways and sticks to sediment. This is a, causes the greatest problems during unfettered economic development. But because sediment gets stored next to waterways, it causes problems after economic maturity and environmental regulation. I use numerical simulations to look at how long sediment stays stored next to rivers before being remobilized and causing re-emissions. I really enjoy my research, but if you'll indulge me, I'd like to talk about something else that I feel is very important this evening. I would like to talk about how we respond to our own fears. These fears can be fears for the dismantling of environmental protections or cuts to scientific funding, research funding. They can be fears of our neighbors, fears of someone around the world whom we'll never meet, fears that we hold deep in our hearts. We can respond to these fears with denial and sarcasm, which can lead us to apathy. We can respond to these fears by entrenchment, which can lead us to xenophobia or bigotry. Or we can choose to respond to these fears with compassion and vulnerability. We can respond in a way that would make Mother Teresa proud. Please take the next few seconds and think about how you would like to respond to your fears. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Next up, we have Catherine Zerlag from the UD College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Hi, so do you guys all remember what happened a couple years ago in Toledo, Ohio? Uh, there was a water crisis where basically uh, the entire city, 300,000 people couldn't use their water for anything. They couldn't use it for their pets, to bathe, or even to drink. Uh, now the reason behind that was a toxic algae bloom that was growing in Lake Erie, uh, which was their drinking water supply. Now the toxic algae bloom starts when you have phosphorus that uh, originates from a agricultural field and makes its way into the lake. Uh, now this uh Phosphorus is good for plants. Plants need phosphorus. However, it's bad when it leaves the field. I want you to picture, uh, after a heavy rainstorm, a muddy stream. Uh, now, equate that muddy stream to phosphorus loss from the agricultural field. Once the stream makes it into the water, uh, it's going to cause an algae bloom. And this algae bloom is going to kill fish, and it's going to make the water unusable for humans to drink or, or use or to wash. So this is where my research comes in. You see, I'm working on um, 
uh, novel techniques to be able to determine the phosphorus in the soil that will lead to algae blooms. Now, this is going to allow for better phosphorus management practices uh, that will reduce algae, algae blooms in the, in the waters. Uh, and if you have any questions if my research is crucial or not, just ask someone from Toledo, Ohio, how they feel uh, when they can't trust their water source. Thank you, Kate. Um, let's give, at this time, we'll have an intermission. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You're going to have to get refitted after the, after the intermission. Let's give another big round of applause for our first set of contestants.